what's so wonderful about the love in the family, and especially, I think, between sisters, is that there's this sort of immediate recognition that you have with someone when you meet someone for the first time. <laughs> That's okay. When you meet someone for the first time and you, you actually have never, ever seen them before, but you look into their eyes and you see Christ, right? And it's just like, <laughs> you know, all of a sudden you have this affinity and uh, connection that it doesn't happen with everybody else. And usually people actually don't look you in the eye, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those things uh, later, but you have a paper in your packet, and I wanted to <laughs> I wanted to give you this picture because my daughter-in-law Jana, she did this one time for me that kind of summarizes all the different things that love is, and we talk a little bit about them this morning, but. Um, you can see in the middle there that it has these funny looking letters, right? <laughs> well, I've studied Aramaic for a long time and you know worked on the translation and did did a concordance and a lexicon and all these different things so people could study the New Testament from the Aramaic Peshitta. Because most people study it from Greek, right? Well, so I, when I first started studying Aramaic, we had like a photocopy of a lexicon and one, one text, and that was it. So everything, every word study we did, we did by hand, where we wrote out every single verse, wrote out the words. I learned how to write. It writes from right to left, like Hebrew. But the thing that... I got so excited about when I first started studying Aramaic was that it painted pictures. And for some reason, my mind just thinks like that. And so when, when I would hear a word like love, for example, go, God is love, I love you. You know, I mean, you try to explain what love is, and there's sort of nothing you can hang your hat on, <laughs> so to speak which is sort of an idiom that we would use, like hang my hat on. Well, in Hebrew and in the, all the Semitic languages, including Aramaic, there are where the, the words themselves have an action behind them. And the action is sort of implied in the word. And once you know the action, um, then you have a way to remember that word, and you'll never forget it. <laughs> So then over the last, I'd say, uh, three or four years, maybe a little bit more, I got into understanding about how each letter of the word actually goes back to a, a very, very old pictograph, it's called, mm -hmm. where the ancient Semitic languages, before there was ever even what you would call Hebrew, there were, there were pic the letters were pictures. And each picture was something common to everyday life. And when you put the pictures together, then that also helped to understand what the word meant. So that's what these little pictures are here. They're actually the letter kath and then baith. So kath is a K-H and Baith is a B. So the word for love in Hebrew is kav. <laughs> and so those two letters are um, really cool pictures. You see how the one, the first one on the right, it looks like a fence? It, it even looks like a fence to us still, you know? <laughs> Obviously, it, the Hebrews did not have a picket fence, <laughs> but... But it still looks like that, where um, there were bars or something. A lot of times the fences in the east were made out of stone. Um, but they were piled in rows, right? OK. And then the second letter is, um, you can see how it starts in the middle, and then it goes around in a circle like this. That's a picture of a one-room house. 
Now, how we got our letter B was they took the one-room house like this, and the Greeks turned it around because the Greeks wrote from left to right like we do, okay? And most of the houses in the Greek and Roman culture were two-story. So they added another story onto the top, and that's how we get B. It's not far away from this really, really old alphabet. But what you have to do then is you just take the two letters and you put them together. So this word love means the fence of the house or the fence of the family. Everyone who's inside the house and inside the family is guarded like on the outside by a wall or by a fence where that fence is love. <laughs> and once you know that, see, now, anytime you talk about how God is love, how we love one another or anything, it always is the same picture. Isn't that cool? <laughs> so now, once you know what the picture is, then you need to know what the action is underneath it, okay? So the action is of the very simple verb to love. It means to breathe on or to kindle like a fire. Like remember, if you want to start a fire, you take some little twigs and you put them all in, <laughs> right? If you breathe on something, it will kindle it. That's the idea behind love. It's, um, <laughs> it's kind of like, what even happened this morning, where you get some people together, sisters, brothers, whoever, and you start sharing things, touching each other, singing together, doing things together, hugging, you know, talking, sharing, all those things are like that breath. They kindle the fire in our hearts. And it's, um, <laughs> I was thinking it's like, Okay, you take, take uh, you've got a fire going, right? And so then you, you stick some stuff on a stick and you stick it in front of the fire and you make shish kebabs, right? <laughs> All right, well, okay, you've got a fire. Then what do you do with it? You've got to do something. You cook with it. You use it to warm yourself. You can't buy it, whatever. Love is something that ends up doing something, too, once the fire is ignited. So I wanted to um, just look at a couple, of, uh, there's three different things that I think um, in, when you do the word study on love and they show how we can love one another. So the first one is to be dear or to cherish. And I wrote on the, on the uh, paper there the verses in Aramaic that we're going to read so that you had them, even though if you don't have my translation. But if you want to get my translation on your phone, you can order the app, <laughs> too. Um, anyway, I want you to turn to Deuteronomy 33. Because this, remember I said, like, it's shish kebab? Okay, the, the Hebrew word is actually kebab. <laughs> it is. It really is. So that's another easy way for us to, to remember it. Now, let, let me just ask again, okay, what is the word picture for love? The simple word picture is the fence of the family, okay? And what's the action? <laughs> okay, all right, we got that. So that's going to carry through all the different places that we want to look at and, and talk about. All right, look at Deuteronomy 33. This is um, the blessing that Moses gave at the end of his life to Israel, and he's recounting a lot of things that happened, how you know they got delivered across the Red Sea and spent 40 years in the wilderness where God took care of them, right? Deuteronomy 33, verse 3. It says, yes, he loved his people, all his holy ones were in his hand, so they followed in your steps, receiving direction from you. Remember I said that, see, 
love is supposed to do something. It guards, right? It guards, like God was guarding Israel in the wilderness. He took care of them and gave them manna every day for 40 years, except on the Sabbath, right? <laughs> but he fed them. He cared for them. He watched over them. He protected them. And then it says that he guided them with his words, right? He gave them direction. He guided them with his words. So all the time that Moses was in the wilderness with them, that's when he got the revelation about how to build the tabernacle and how to worship God and what's important to do. Every step of the way, there was an unfolding of God's direction for them. So you see, his love was not, God's love was not stagnant, <laughs> you know. It, it was moving. It was doing things. It was going places. And the, the thing that God did was he, he, like, drew them close to him, put this wall around them to, so that he could cherish them, so he could hide them in his arms. And the word kebab is not used a whole lot of times in the Old Testament, but the idea of God being a shepherd and holding and cherishing um, like a baby lamb in his arms is throughout the whole Old Testament, right? <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, right? You can look at Isaiah 40. This is one of my very favorite verses about this idea of how God cherishes us. Isaiah 40. And it's a, it's a prophecy also about Jesus Christ. Verse 11. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. He will gather the lambs in his arms, and he will carry them in his bosom. Okay, that's a picture of how the shepherd had this big mantle that he would wear, and it folded over in the front, and then he had a girdle around it, and on the girdle he would hang his rod and his staff and uh, different his pouch with food in it so that he was free to walk around. But in the way the cloak was sewn, it had this pocket on the inside of it. So when it was folded over, it actually had a pocket all the way through it. And when a little baby lamb was hurting or it needed something or it was sick or it just needed anything, he would take the baby lamb and he would stick them in his pocket. So his little front legs were hanging off one side and his little back legs were hanging. <laughs> And that way he could still walk around and care for all the other sheep, right? But the baby lamb was close to his bosom. That's what it means to carry him in his bosom. And in John it talks about how Jesus was in the bosom of his father, right? God carried his son close to his heart and cared for him. Now, you know, the shepherd didn't always carry the lambs, right? Sometimes he carried them on his shoulders too, but that picture of the, the, the pocket, I call it, <laughs> the pocket of the mantle, I learned that, like, I don't know, quite a long time ago, and I was talking to God one day and just said, you know, I really, I think I really need to get in the pocket. You know, I just not feeling so hot here. I don't, I don't know what to do. I'm really lost. And so, you know, I just felt like he picked me up and just held me so close. And um, so I would periodically do that when I felt like I really had a need. Um, the shepherd would put oil on the little baby lambs and tend his, his wounds and, you know, give him a pat and say, it's going to be okay. And then, so when the lamb was feeling better, he would take him out of the pocket and let him go. And it's like, yay, here we go. <laughs> so, so one day I was feeling kind of puny and, um, and I, I thought about this thing with the pocket. And so I was going, okay, I got to get up in the pocket. I, I, please, 
I need the pocket. No, I need the pocket. And all of a sudden, I just heard this really quiet voice like, you can't jump up in the pocket, Jan. You have to let me pick you up. And I've never forgotten that because it's exactly how God cherishes us. See, we, we can think, oh, I have this great need. I'm, I got to do all this stuff. Help, help, help. And then he's really just going, will you just let me <laughs> pick you up, take care of you, guide you, teach you my word, do whatever we need to do here. Um, because that's really the whole idea of being held in the bosom. So when we talk about loving one another, then how does that apply? We can do the same thing. See, we can breathe <laughs> to kindle the fire. But when you really truly love one another, then we do that same thing. We draw a person close to us and say, I accept you. I think you're beautiful. You are special. Like we say, <laughs> we're not ordinary. We're extraordinary. But, you know, the way God does that is like in, in every um, family, everybody is unique. You know, I have a beautiful family. I have three children, and now I have four, almost five grandchildren. And every one of them is so special and unique. So it... It helps us to see when we have an earthly family. It also helps us to see when we have a family of the believers where we can see each other as um, not, not just, I'm not ordinary, but the extraordinary part. Like to look and to meet someone and say, what makes you extraordinary? <laughs> Let me... Let, yeah, come here. I need to talk to you. <laughs> I need you to tell me about your life. See, what, what has God done for you? How is he working in you? And, and that's how we draw close to each other. Okay, the second thing is about um, providing and protecting one another. And this is, comes from uh, the Hebrew word that's the comparison word to kav, and it actually starts with an olive. That's the very first letter of the alphabet, like alpha, bet, right? Aleph, bet is, is the, are the Hebrew word letters. That's how we got our word alphabet. And when you add the olive onto the word and change the kath, which is the fence, to an H, that's the letter he. And a hey is a picture of a man with his arms raised like this, going, hey! <laughs> and it means behold or look. <laughs> yeah, every time you want to raise your hands, everybody just raise your hands. See, like, behold! <laughs> See? Okay. <laughs> and it can mean revealed. All right. So olive means the strong one, and hey means revealed. And then you have faith is the family again. So this variation of the word for love means the strong one revealed to the family. The strong one revealed to the family. Who's the strong one? God, <laughs> right? Because he is not only the epitome of love, he is the father of the family. So all these words tie together, and I could go on and on. Um, I was thinking, actually, about the word for sister today. It's the, um, the Aramaic word is kati, and it has this word fence in it. Aww. So when I call you my sister, that's kati, then I'm saying you're my fence. You, you come and you protect me. Aww. Isn't that cool? So this is what God does. He protects and he reveals himself as the strongest one. There is no greater one than God, our God, who is our Father. He is the strong one. You know the word El, like El Shaddai, right? The word El means the strong one. <laughs> um, another thing that's tied in with this word Ahav with the hay in it is the 
the uh, verb to give. And um, to give is yahav, <laughs> and ahav <laughs> is love. So they're really closely related in that part of love is giving. Same thing that God did, you know, was talking about in the wilderness and all that. But it, look at Zephaniah. <laughs> we get to go to another book that's way up back there. Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Okay, Zephaniah chapter 3. This is a really fun verse, too. Verse 17 says, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He's the strong one, right? He's the mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will rest you is what King James says, right? He, he will rest you or he renews you by his love is another translation where he quiets us with his love. Now, why? <laughs> because he built this wall around his family, a fence to guard them and protect them and so that everyone who's inside that fence, he can tend them protect them, teach them, do all these things, see? The, the wall around it is what the protection is, but the guarding and the tending on the inside is where we get quieted. It's like the sheep. <laughs> if the sheep is in the sheepfold, they can lay down. They can rest. They can go to the still waters, and their, our souls can be restored, just like Psalm 23 is talking about. And it's like a refuge. <laughs> Being inside the fence of God's family is like a refuge. So look at Romans chapter 5. How does this apply to us as, as far as like how we can love one another? And I think it has the same idea. Not only do we want to like draw people close to us, but... We, we need to protect one another. Like if someone's coming to my sister Trish and she's got an attack going in her life, what do I do? I go take my shield, <laughs> the shield of faith, in the name of Jesus Christ, get away from my sister, right? We stand with each other and guard each other and then um, that's also how God ha has, it's like an application of how God protects us, then we do that for each other. So Romans 5, look at this. <laughs> Start in verse 6. It says, Now if Christ at this time, because of our weakness, died for the ungodly, for seldom does anyone die for the un ungodly, although for good ones perhaps some would dare to die. Here God has manifested his love that is toward us, because if when we were sinners, Christ died for us, then how much more will we be justified now by his blood and be rescued from wrath by him? Christ died for us when we were very, very unlovable. <laughs> he died for sinners, of which we are like chief. He, he died for us when we were sinners. Did you think about that in terms of how God pro provides his love for people and protects people? Because it's easy to love someone who loves you back. You know, everybody's really loving here, right? <laughs> but um, it's, it's not that easy sometimes to love somebody. Um, some, say someone hurt you, you know, or someone says cruel words. Words are really, really powerful. We, we were talking about that this morning. Uh, one of the things in the Armour book is about the principality of Beelzebub. And Beelzebub is called in Matthew, about he's called the prince of the devils. But his name means Baal Daba, and that means lord of the words. 
He uses words, his main tactic is to use words to dominate and control people. So whenever anyone is speaking words that agree with his words, then they are also dominating and controlling people. The power that is in that principality is pretty extensive and it crosses over into the church, into business, all sorts of areas. So that's why we need to <laughs> speak what the word says, speak what God says, because it totally then co contradicts that principality and negates it. And they have, it just destroys the influence of it. So that's, that's the thing. Well, God loved you when you were a sinner. God loves me when I'm a sinner. So when I look at a brother or a sister, then I don't see sinner. I see what, God, what Christ did for them. And that's what I speak out. And that's what will help them. Um, look at 1 John chapter 4. Remember it says in Ephesians about being imitators of God as dear children? Okay, we're dear children. I am a child of God. I, am, I just love that song. Um, but be an imitator of God means that we do this same kind of protection and provision for people, no matter what, no matter whether they're they're actually wanting it or receiving it or not. You, it's a, definitely a walk by revelation, but we can love the unlovable. Chapter 4, verse 11. My beloved ones, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. But no one has ever seen God. If we have, but if we, have, if we love one another... God remains in us, and his love is completed in us. Go back up to verse 9. By this, the love of God toward us is known, because God sent his unique son into the world that we would have life by him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us, and he sent his son as a payment for our sins. The, to be a lover of one another, we have to be the one to say, I'm going to do this first. And i not looking at the failures and faults and frailties of the person that I want to love. That's what God did. So we speak out, we do whatever it takes to not only draw a person close to us, right, but then... What can I do for you? What is your need? What can I pray for you? That's where all the thing came from about going out and, you know, just talking to people and saying, can I pray for you? <laughs> Why are we doing that? Why did you want to even do that? It's to do those two things, draw a person, but then go, here, here's what I want to tell you about is how God is a father, and he wants to provide your every need. So what is it you need? Do you need healing? Do you need peace? Do you need answers in your life? Do you need wisdom? What is it you need? That's what we're asking. See? And then when the, when the person goes, well, yeah, I, I want you to pray for me. <laughs> sure. Then, bam. There's the revelation. Here's the words, blah, 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 whatever it is that that person needs, right? It's so exciting that way. Okay, but now there's got to be a little tiny bit more about love. God's love is so, it's so deep, right? The unsearchable riches of Christ. So look at Deuteronomy 32, this last characteristic is about how God has made us the apple of his eye. Deuteronomy 32, and in verse 9. But the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob, his allotted heritage. He found him in a desert land, 
and in the howling waste of the wilderness. He encircled him. <laughs> There's the drawing of the fence, right? He encircled him. He cared for him. He drew him close. And he kept him as the apple of his eye. Now, we think of an apple as this shiny red thing, right? <laughs> but this is not talking about a, a physical apple. It's talking uh, actually about the pupil of your eye. If you look at your neighbor, just look at them straight in the eye, and you see the black part of the pupil, right? <laughs> That's, he says, God says he keeps us as the pupil of your eye. Now, what does that mean? Well, he actually designed our physical bodies with eyebrows, right, and then eyelashes. And the eyelashes prevent, well, first of all, the eyebrows filter the light so that our pupils will not get blasted with ultraviolet light. And then the, the um, <laughs> eyelashes, <laughs> they prevent things um, from coming into your eye, right? They, they guard your eye. They you know, allow the water to circulate around in it. And, and every time you blink, you're washing your eye clean again. And so God designed this really cool thing to guard our eyes. So it says he keeps us as the pupil of his eye, of his eye. And then another way that you can understand that, and literally in, in the Hebrew idiom of it, is it's the little man in the eye. So look at your neighbor again and look into their eyes. What you... What you actually see, if you look carefully, is you see a reflection of yourself. <laughs> so what it's saying when God holds us as the apple of his eye is he's holding us closely in his reflection so that he never, ever lets go of looking at us. And he holds us so dear and so close that he also never stops looking at us. Mm -hmm. Like if you, you know, when you're talking to someone, you usually there will be eye contact, right? You know, and the more you have pretty deep eye contact with someone, that you start to have this connection because, like I said, you see the Christ in them, right? But, but people look away. You're looking down, you're looking around. Oh, yeah, hi, how are you? I'm doing great, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? Right? It's hard to stay focused, to really look someone in the eye for any length of time. And yet, that's what God says he does. He, ne he never stops looking at our reflection in his eye. So he shel shelters us, and he protects us with his eyelashes, <laughs> and he whispers in our ear saying how special you are, how unique you are. And I just wanted to read you the words of Sal Arico's song about the apple of my eye, because now you'll see it a whole lot deeper. Because when you were tired, I picked you up and gave you the rest to your soul. When you were lonely and searching for truth, I gave you my word and made you whole. Just like Moses was talking about how God guided them in the wilderness and gave him his word. Because I love you so, my child, tenderly I watch over you. Because I love you so, my child, precious are you in my sight, for you are the apple of my eye. When you were lost... I showed you the way and brought you from darkness to light. When you were hungry, thirsty, and faint, I gave you the bread of life. You are the salt of the earth. You are the lights of the world. Beloved, now are you the sons of God. My strength is your strength. Like God is the mighty one. He's the strong one. He, has the, he is the one who has the strength. 
My power is your power. So be strong, my children. Have no fear. Be strong and know that I am here. Be strong. Encourage with my word. Be strong, my children. Have no fear. Now, it says that perfect love casts out fear, right? Right? Perfect love casts out fear. Well, it's not talking about my love. It's talking about how God loves us, right? If I receive and I truly grab onto the idea that God loves me unconditionally, he will do this for me. He's cherishing me. He'll protect me. He'll guard me. He'll teach me. Then I don't have to be afraid of anything. And then once we have that, says, um, love your neighbor as yourself, right? We're to love God first. Then love your neighbor as yourself. How can you love your neighbor unless you have received God's love for yourself? Once we receive that for ourselves, then we can turn around and love one another. The last verse says, when you were hurt by some unkind word, <laughs> I dried the tears from your eyes. I, I took you up in my pocket. <laughs> Remember, my children, that I'm for you and forever you'll be by my side because I love you so, my child. Tenderly, I watch over you. Because I love you so, my child, precious are you in my sight. You are the apple of my eye. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> it just really captures the whole idea of what I'm trying to share here. So one, one last exhortation, I guess, is to go to Ephesians 4. I'm sorry, verse five, uh, chapter 5 is what I want to read first. Verse 1, <laughs> Therefore imitate God as beloved sons and walk in love as Christ also loved us and delivered himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smell. Okay, be imitators of God. Just a little bit of what we learned right now. Be the fence of the family. Be the one who, who you, people can come to and call you Kati, my sister. Come here, come here, <laughs> whatever you need. I'll, I'll spend time with you. I'll, I'll be there for you. Now go back over to chapter 4. Verse, it says to, I beg you that you should walk as is proper for the calling wherewith you are called. Walk worthy of the calling in verse 1. With all humbleness of mind and quietness, how can we be quiet if we don't receive the quietness of God's love? Right? See, we receive these things from God first. Then we can give them. So we walk worthy with all. Meekness or humbleness of mind, quietness, and long-suffering. <laughs> I just have to tell you that word long, what the word long-suffering is. It literally means to blow out the breath or be long of breath. So it's like, <sighs> and then you speak or do whatever. Because, <laughs> you know, to, it takes a lot of patience and, and sometimes keeping our mouths shut, you know, to not react to something when, you know, something is going on. But then this last part is the really coolest part. Hold up one another in love. Whoop. So that, that really summarizes it. Do these three things. Draw people close. Provide and protect for them. Go, what is your need? What can I do for you? And then keep them as a close reflection in your eye and in your heart. And hold up one another in this kind of love. The love that God has given to us. It's perfect. It's the fence of the family. <laughs> so that's what I wanted to share this morning. Yeah.